So um, as Susie will talk about in a few minutes, we plan and plan and plan really starting in, in August. And we have a big mandatory training on February 28th. Um, and the week after that, the week before spring break, we check with all our placements to make sure everything's good. And we had a tiny little hint about this coronavirus thing and we checked with them. We're like in an abundance of caution. We just wanna check with you to make sure everything's okay. Everybody got back to us said, no problem, send your students. Uh, March 6th was the Friday before spring break. When we're getting ready to send our 52 students to 25 different placements. And um, I looked back at the front page of the New York Times on March 6th that day, and it was a completely different world. Um, it feels like it was about a year ago, but Elizabeth Warren had just dropped out of the race. There was a picture of Elizabeth Warren, her husband and her dog, taking up the whole top of the, of the front page of the New York Times. They were talking about Barr's mishandling of the Mueller report. We were talking about Bernie Sanders ties to the former Soviet Union. We were talking about the fact that it was gonna be a two man race and women weren't surprised. And there was a, and the main article was worrying about the airlines losing money. So we sent our intrepid 52 students off and by Wednesday, March 11th, uh, they had announced that this was a pandemic. On Thursday, March 12th, um, our students who were at the Brooklyn Defenders were um, kindly asked to leave <laughs> because it was such a crazy, chaotic time. People were testing positive. Um, they couldn't handle our students. Um, and as you can imagine, our students handled, handled all of this with incredible grace and professionalism and commitment and perseverance. We got wonderful feedback from all of our supervisors. Our students were tweeting about the experience. Um, we are so incredibly proud of them. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Susie to tell you a little bit more about how the program works. But I also just wanna, well, when we get into the individual speakers, I think you all know that to the right at the top of your screen, you can put it in speaker mode. So you'll see the person who's speaking and you don't have to scroll through to look for them. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Susie. Thanks, Lori. It's so good to see 65 of you, either seeing your faces or your names. Thanks for joining us. This is really, um, this is all about good news. And really, it's hard to believe that the last time our students were working directly with clients and lawyers was really through ASB and during that week. So this is a good reminder of where we're headed. And I hope for some of you that means um, this summer, at least in the fall, you're going to be back working with clients and working with lawyers in the field. So let's remember the good stuff. Um, for those of you sort of new to Roger Williams ASB program, I just want to briefly tell you a little history about the program. This is our 14th year. The program began as really a student-driven initiative uh, right after Hurricane Katrina. Since then, the program has grown. It's now a large program. This year, we sent 52 students to 25 placements. We've had years where we've sent almost 80 students. So the Feinstein Center has sort of taken this under our umbrella to administer the program. Although, as you'll hear later today, students play a huge role in leading the program, but we, we try to take a lot of the administrative burden off of the students. So our next slide, Lori. So really we have three main goals for alternative spring break. The first one is simply to engage our students in pro bono service. Our second one is to expose students to the struggles that uh, low income clients face in their communities. And also in the past few years, we really incorporated a lot of um, climate environmental placements because many of our students are looking to do public interest work in that setting. And lastly, it's really to teach our students about a specific type of public interest law. So both the legal issues in those um, areas, as well as introducing students to what public interest lawyering looks like in terms of practice. Next slide. Another goal of our program is about letting students get proximate to access to justice issues. This photo, hopefully many of you recognize, is Brian Stevenson. For us, proxim uh, proximity means getting close to clients, getting close to communities, getting close to public interest lawyers. And in some cases, this means leaving Rhode Island to get close to certain communities and certain legal issues. And in other projects, it means getting to know a new community right here in Rhode Island, or even for some of our students, getting to know their communities from a legal standpoint and from the perspective of, of a public interest lawyer. 
Brian Stevenson has said, you cannot be an effective problem solver from a distance. There are details and nuances to problems that you will miss unless you're close enough to observe those details. By no means do we think five days is enough time for our students to fully understand the access to justice crisis in our country or to really problem solve effectively. But we really see ASB as either a first step for many of our first year law students, and in some cases, second and third year students, and also for students who've done ASB as well as summer internships or clinics, it can be an additional step in the way that we here at Roger Williams believe in multi -layer, a multi-layered approach to experiential learning, as well as helping our students to understand and appreciate their professional responsibility to increase access to justice. Next slide, Lori. So just logistics, again, Lori mentioned, this really is a huge um, undertaking. Each year we select two student leaders who have done ASB in the past. We really spend August, September, and October both securing our old placements as well as identifying new placements. And we try really hard to identify new placements based on the legal needs that present themselves. So for instance, next year, I have a feeling that we will likely have work involving um, COVID-19, all of the legal issues that will be presenting themselves. But we also ask students where they wanna go. A lot of our students wanna go home. They wanna serve in a community that maybe we don't normally have access to. So we, we, we spend a lot of time identifying new placements. We provide a best practices guide that we authored a few years ago to each of our placements that is really specific in terms of the structure that we hope that our placements will provide our students. We also do a mandatory orientation. Lori mentioned just students leave, we do a two or three hour session where we have wonderful guest speakers like our librarians. Nicole spoke this year, Lucinda has spoken in the past, reminding students that they have access to the amazing resources here at the law school while they're out on their ASB placements. We also spend a lot of time during that training um, teaching students about reflective lawyering and encouraging them to do daily reflections as well as a final reflection about their ASB experience. Um, and we create a structure for them to use when they're reflecting so that they can take observations, they can take some of the practice doing specific skills and really start to think about what it means to their professional identity as they begin to sort of take on the role of lawyer. And then we do a post meeting debrief we did with all the students the Wednesday after they returned, which as you can imagine was a crazy time. We were just starting, actually we hadn't started remote learning. It was extended spring break. But every student who participated in this year's program was on that call, giving us really great feedback on things that were wonderful, things that were challenging, um, and really thinking about what the program meant to them. Next slide. So this year we had two fantastic ASB leaders, Natalie Fisher uh, and Ivan Cody, who are second year students. Lori's giving them a big clap. Um, they were just fantastic. This, this program, like I mentioned, it just requires a lot of, uh, there are a lot of details and it also requires a lot of creativity and energy. And Natalie and Ivan brought both creativity and energy to every weekly meeting we had. And I'd love for the two of them to quickly just introduce themselves and talk about why they decided to take on a leadership position. Oh, well, thank you, Susie and uh, the ladies of the Feinstein Center. Uh, and I also want to thank everyone here uh, for giving me a reason to wear a collared shirt today. So it was very nice to whip it out of the closet. But as she was saying, um, I had an excellent time after participating in ASB my first year. And after seeing the program, I kind of wanted to really get involved with it and uh, kind of take it to like a next level. And so me and Natalie submitted an application, we were selected. And then this year long process that started in August and is just now kind of coming to its end. Uh, sadly, of course, uh, it's been an amazing journey and like the things that we've done, the things that we've been able to accomplish and the way that we've been able to push the program forward. I've just been as astonished by the progress we've made as well as I've learned along the way as well. And I'm sure Natalie has similar things, if not better things to say about the program as well. Yeah, so Ivan and I were actually at the same placement. We were both at the Waterfront Commission uh, last year, which was a new placement. Um, so we were so excited to go and see what that was all about. And it ended up being absolutely fantastic. I couldn't have had a better experience. Um, I'm not from the area. So 
I didn't, I haven't spent a lot of time in New York. So that was really exciting to kind of like live in Manhattan for a week. Um, and after that experience, I was like, okay, well, what next? I, I want to be more involved with this program. The ladies in the Feinstein Center are absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, so if anyone's thinking about being a leader next year, I highly, highly recommend. Thank you. I think Lori's now going to take over and talk a little bit about our list of projects from this year's program. Yep. So here's the whole group. Uh, this is a picture at our at our mandatory orientation this year is uh, we sent 52 students to 25 different placements. So I'm just going to walk you through the placements where we don't have people speaking today and then we're going to highlight eight of our projects, but I want you to see the students that participated. Um, and the alums who were uh, our host supervisors. So uh, as always, we send students to the Bronx Defenders and Michael Thomas, who many of you remember, one of our stars, uh, is one of their supervisors in the Bronx Defenders. We send students to the Brooklyn Defenders and I hope uh, faculty and staff remember Asia Sierra Millette and Laura Rodriguez and James Mercurio, three alums who supervise our students there. Um, and many of them did alternative spring break and then ended up there as, um, as attorneys. We always send people to Central Falls Law Department uh, where Matt Jerzyk and Robert Weber, Weber, two alums are. This year for the first time we sent um, students to Common Cause and hopefully you recognize John Marion. He's the executive director of Common Cause, a, a, a big player on our local scene and he's in our Master of Law program and he asked to have students and it was a great, great week for them. Uh, Conservation Law Foundation is local uh, and we always, they will take one student every year and we always have a great experience there. Uh, Committee for Public Counsel Services in New Bedford, uh, alums Tom Mello and Aaron Stedman are supervising attorney. Sorry, Tom's an alum as well from way back um, and they've been in the program for a long time. The Island Institute in Rockland, Maine, shout out to Julia and the Marine Affairs Institute. Nick Batista is one of their stars um, and he has been hosting a great trip for several years now. Uh, we gave him a little time off when he had some kids and now he's back in the program. Uh, Legal Aid Juvenile Rights Practice Group, this is my, uh, the office I went to right after I graduated from law school. They've been taking students for about the last six to eight years. Um, and we sent uh, uh, three fabulous students who had a great experience. Legal Assistance of Western New York, Rochester and Bath. We actually have three alums in this office, which is quite astonishing. Ashley Dickinson, Cassie Foley, and Amelia Coli, and Brooklyn Crockton. A 1L happens to be from that area, and she had a great time and was able to go home for the week. Operation Stand Down. This is a new one this year because they now have their own separate legal project and two of our alums are there, Kaylin Peltier-Koenig and Kaylee Wildenhain. The Rhode Island Attorney General and their environmental unit. This was environmental unit. This was a new placement this year that we were really excited about and Allie Hoffman, another star from our joint degree program, Marine Affairs Institute, uh, was the supervising attorney. Rhode Island Center for Justice. Um, right there in Providence, you see Michaela Bland and Christine Bradley. They are both fellows. Michaela's a Scadden, Scadden fellow this year and Christine is our um, Roger Williams fellow. That's the whole staff and several students. I know at least um, Shea is going back there for the summer and they had a great week. Rhode Island Legal Services we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, we do have many, many alums there, but I don't think our alums were the ones supervising them this year. Rhode Island Public Defender is a new one that we started doing last year. Um, Diana DeGroof, many of you know, got our Champions for Justice Alumni Award a few years ago. She recently moved from Rhode Island Legal Services to the Public Defender, and she was supervising our students along with Andy McElroy, who many of you know. Waterfront Commission of New York Harbor, this is the, the trip that Natalie and Ivan went on last year. They prosecute um, uh, they, they prosecute organized crime on the waterfront and you'll recognize, I hope, um, Patrick O'Connor on the left. He wasn't at the project, but he uh, works in the area and came over and had lunch and a conversation with the students. West Palm Beach Public Defender, um, Autumn Garnaccia is an alum there and she got this program started last year and our students had a terrific time with her. 
And now I'm going to um, turn it over to Natalie and Ivan to sort of MC this part um, and introduce each student who's going to speak. Um, and if you have questions as we're going around, um, I, I'm not sure if the chat function works when there's a presentation. So you, either you can put your name in the chat function um, and then Ivan and Natalie will call on you after all the student presentations. We love questions. So Natalie and Ivan, take it away. Well, thank you, Lori. Um, just as Lori was saying, we had an amazing group of people and we had a lot of groups that wanted to present, but we kind of selected eight to present to you guys here today and here are their stories in honor of all the SBU I've been binge watching. Uh, the first of all, we're going to start off with Carrie Ann, who's going to talk about her work at the Immigration Law Education and Advocacy Project at Catholic Social Services right here in Fall River. So Carrie Ann, take it away. Um, hi everyone, I'm Carrie Ann Dangos. Um, I'm a 1L and me and my fellow 1L Marcella went to ILEAP, which is the acronym. Um, and it covers some of Eastern Rhode Island, but the Fall River Diocese. So it covers all the way from Fall River out to Hyannis at the Cape. Um, and it provides low cost, high quality immigration work and education. Um, so it lets clients know that what their rights are um, in the country and what they're able to obtain citizenship wise. Um, it focused a lot on um, obtaining lawful permanent resident status for undocumented immigrants. Um, I myself worked under Tiana Bisco, Nate Pittman. She recently got married and unfortunately had to cancel her honeymoon due to COVID. Um, but I worked under her and worked on an inadmissibility waiver, um, which was really cool. Was, I basically worked on a cover letter using persuasive writing to show why she should be become a lawful permanent resident. And my um, colleague Marcella worked on asylum research for country conditions in Guatemala. Um, and it was a very interesting experience. I think that for us having legal practice too under our belt was definitely helpful because it taught us what to look for in our clients' stories that would help be most beneficial to help their story in obtaining lawful permanent resident status or seeking asylum. Um, so shout out to Professor Hashway. Um, so I would say that the best part was seeing the complexities of immigration law. Um, you know, you don't really see, the media doesn't show a lot of how difficult it truly is and how many steps and how much work goes into it. So it was definitely interesting seeing it firsthand and being able to help. And I ended up doing a cover letter template with um, Tiana just to make sure things go a little smoothly for them. And um, I would say the highlight would be, I, we worked with a paralegal who actually was an asylum refugee. Um, he escaped the Khmer Rouge reign in Cambodia. So it was really great to see him not only have gain citizenship, citizenship status here, but to be able to still be helping people like him um, obtain the same thing. So it was really nice to be able to see that in action. So it was something I never thought that I would do, but now I'm considering doing the immigration clinic. So I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested. All right, thank you, Carrie Ann. So next slide, please, Lori. So next, we're going to hear about the Women's Law Project from Julie Smith. Hey, everybody. Uh, so my name is Julie Smith, and I'm a 1L. And I went um, to Pittsburgh to work with the Women's Law Project. I think I saw Professor Sack on here, um, which I, I wanted to say, I think you would have particularly liked this placement. Um, they specialized in abortion and reproductive health, domestic and sexual violence, sex and gender discrimination, and workplace equality. It was a fantastic placement. Um, I was working with Christine Castro. I think she graduated a few years ago. And they had me basically researching a whole bunch of cases that had been overturned uh, using the Equal Rights Amendment which I don't know anything about, but I am on Professor Goldstein's wait list <laughs> for con law, just, uh, just letting you know, <laughs> looking forward to that class. Uh, but basically I was researching all these sexist laws that had been overturned um, and they were dealing with all kinds of stuff like alimony, um, car insurance rates, child support, 
adoption rights. And essentially, they were having me look up key language that they were going to use to try and overturn this other really um, key case that affected a lot of their uh, clients regarding um, abortion and reproductive health. I loved being part of it. It was um, it was like having a voice in um, a lot of issues that I've always cared about and always wanted to be part of. They also had me do a string citation, which I don't know if Professor Malonis is here, but um, anyway, got to learn how to do that in a real setting where I, I could, they, they put my string citation in their pleading um, and made sure that I knew how appreciated it was. So that was really cool to see um, something that I did actually in a document that they were using. Um, let's see, as far as the influence on my career, I'm not exactly sure what I want to do yet, uh, but I do care a lot about uh, women's issues in the law. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe, I certainly feel like I, I built some really good connections with the Women's Law Project, and it's certainly um, a type of group of people that I would really like to work with in the future. Um, the highlights, I really liked sitting around the lunch table every day and hearing these uh, really interesting and cool lawyers talk about their uh, just general issues in the community and kind of laugh about it in this kind of dark humor kind of way. But <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, I got to also see uh, they had fought really hard to get this yellow buffer zone painted around a Planned Parenthood in Pittsburgh, and I got to walk over and, and see it in, in real life, and that was really cool to see um, the work that they had done there. So that was my experience, and I would say it was very worthwhile, and I really appreciate um, having this experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for your story. And I'm pretty sure the professors really enjoyed the shout outs. Goldstein, you might want to get on <laughs> that a wait list. <laughs> um, next up, we have uh, the South Coast Fair Housing Project. And Stephanie Gonzalez is going to tell you her wonderful story. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Gonzalez. I'm a 2L. I had the opportunity of spending uh, my spring break at South Coast Fair Housing. They are a nonprofit fair housing organization providing education, outreach, advocacy, and enforcement services to all of Rhode Island, but also the Bristol and Plymouth counties in Massachusetts. The organization focuses on four um, things primarily. Uh, the first is they assist individuals with exercising their fair housing rights. They also investigate and identify discriminatory housing practices through something called peer testing. This is the organization's primary method for, um, com for confirming the dis discriminatory practices happening. Um, they advocate for policies that will further fair housing protections. As an example, they're currently working to ensure that Rhode Island enacts a law that would make it illegal to discriminate against people who are seeking to rent an apartment but have a, a Section 8 voucher. This is known as source of income discrimination. And they also uh, perform fair housing outreach and educational activities. Um, this is sort of their preventative measure. They go out and train new landlords, realtor groups, and other organizations serving people who are vulnerable to discrimination as a way to deter um, discriminatory practices going forward. Um, the beginning of our time was really spent discussing and learning um, about the Federal Fair Housing Act, which recognizes a number of protected classes and statuses, including familial status, marital status, race, ethnicity, and disability as protected groups. What was particularly interesting was learning about the ways that um, states actually add additional protection. So for example, Massachusetts has a protection for source of income, um, but Rhode Island doesn't. And Rhode Island recognizes gender expression as a protected group where Massachusetts does not. Uh, we also spent our time with other legal entities serving the area and doing similar work, um, including the Commission Against Discrimination in Massachusetts and also the legal team at South Coast Legal Services. Um, but I have to say that the highlight of our experience was being able to work directly with attorneys um, to research and to prepare complaints that would ultimately get submitted to the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. In the grand scheme of things, this is very, very small. 
They do these every single day. It took us three days to complete one of them, but it felt really good to, um, to be trusted as a student um, to support in this work and that that complaint would ultimately get submitted and hold um, discriminatory landlords accountable. We saw a number of connections between our classes and our work. Um, it was really neat to hear the language used by attorneys to mirror much of what we've learned in con law about equal protection and also having a deeper conversation about the doctrine of standing and how South Coast Fair Housing as a third party could bring a lawsuit against um, parties who discriminate. Um, so shout out to our con law professors who certainly prepared us for this moment and enabled us to contribute meaningfully to those discussions. Um, our biggest takeaway was definitely that there's a great need for pro bono attorneys to represent tenants who are facing evictions or being discriminated against. We spent our Friday observing housing court and what we saw was that the overwhelming majority of tenants appear before a judge without any legal representation, while landlords certainly appear before the judge with their um, attorney right next to them. It was a clear display of the imbalance of power and I'm so grateful for having had this experience. The three of us who were there aren't sure what we're gonna do after graduation, um, but certainly we're considering um, fair housing work as an area that we focus on. All right, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was so great to hear about South Coast. Uh, now we're gonna hear from Nancy, who was- Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my name is Nancy Vasquez. I'm a first year law student here at Roger Williams, and I got to spend my week volunteering with uh, the South Texas Pro Bono Asylum Representation Project, which we call ProBar. And um, I got to travel with three other students and Professor Gonzalez. Um, so we volunteer with ProBar, which is a nonprofit organization that helps immigrants along the Rio Grande um, Valley border region. And we did a, lo a lot of work um, in the office. Uh, we got to um, take down declarations. We spoke with clients on the phone and we also texted them because some of these uh, clients were at the other side of the border. Um, we got to translate a lot of these documents as well. We prepared asylum applications and T visa applications and a few students prepared country condition reports. Um, at the end of the week, we were able to help seven people with their application process. Of course, we didn't finish everything for them, but we did finish uh, the work that we had for ourselves and we left those folders ready for um, the attorneys at ProBar to work on um, later. So uh, just a big shout out to Professor uh, Gonzalez because she helped us along the way. I myself have never filled out any of these applications. So she was a great help um, in guiding us through this whole process. Um, outside the office, we also got to do a few things. We got to attend the children's court and the children's court is a um, court for children who cross the border by themselves and who are represented by the pro bar attorneys. Um, we sat in their hearings and it was a very emotional experience because they, um, they, a lot of these children, well, all of these children don't speak English. Um, so there was someone translating for them. Um, but I still think it would have been confusing to understand what was going on in the court because even as for, for myself, as a law student, I didn't understand a lot of the things going on. Um, we also got to cross to uh, Mexico. We were in Matamoros for a few minutes and we got to see the tent city. And the tent city is where all of the refugees are currently staying and they are living in these tents with their families. That's basically their new home for now. Um, and they are staying there as they wait for their court hearing on the other side of the border. So we crossed back to the US and we got to attend the tent court and tent court takes place inside a tent and we sat there uh, listening to a few of the court hearings um, in the middle of it all the lights went out and we were sitting in the dark for a while so it was kind of awkward sitting in court in the dark um, but that was also quite the uh, unique uh, moment i guess um, we also got to visit a shelter and the shelter is there to provide a home and food for those immigrants who have crossed and who are just waiting for uh, or to hear from their immigration status. We also got to visit a detention center and in the detention center we spoke to with a lady from Cuba 
and we took her deco declaration. We spoke with her for a few minutes and we asked her some very personal questions, some very emotional moments um, popped up that she had to speak about. Um, so it was a very um, unique experience to talk with a client about their journey to the U.S. Um, overall, I think I speak for myself and for the other students and even maybe Professor Gonzalez about our experience when I say that this was a very unique experience, a very emotional one, not just because of the things that we saw and the people we spoke with, but because of this whole situation going on right now. Uh, for me personally, I definitely want to practice immigration law in the future, but um, I also think that we definitely need more pro bono attorneys at the border right now. And um, there's a lot of immigrants waiting for help or in need of help who can't afford a private attorney. So that was uh, my experience and uh, our experience at the Texas border. Thank you. And before we leave this, um, this project, thank you so much, Nancy. I think that um, Professor Gonzalez is on the call and I wanna see if she could say a few words about the project. We are so grateful um, to Professor Gonzalez. She, this is the third trip to the border she's taken our students on, given up her, her spring break to supervise our students. And many of these projects will not allow our students to come without an attorney. Um, and Debbie makes these trips possible. So Debbie, if you could say a few words, that'd be great. Thank you, Lori. I know um, Nancy didn't give justice to the amount of work that they did. It was, I had uh, Nancy uh, Vasquez Rios, I had Damaris one, Damaris Hernandez, and then Damaris two, which is Damaris Cruz, and then I had Jennifer um, Perez, who's the 3L. And these students really um, showed me, and I think ProBar, um, what they're made of. You know, these are students who had never written an affidavit before. Um, who did an interview by phone with someone who was in Matamoros, someone who is under the MPP program, for those of you have, who have heard of it, which is the Return to Mexico program. Uh, you know, Nancy didn't do justice to the amount of work that they did, and I was super impressed by their ability to, in a week, uh, put forward seven asylum applications, and Nancy said they didn't finish them, they just about did. Um, they put a complete packet together ready for court. Um, the only thing that was needed was for someone to hand it to the person across the border. Um, I think what we saw was um, heartbreaking. I was grateful to have these students there to help us um, and to help ProBar do the work that they do. Um, I, I can't speak enough about, you know, Nancy, you know, D1, D2, as I call them, and Jennifer. Um, for all the work that they did. These students were really, really fabulous and definitely made the trip worthwhile for the people that they helped, but then also for me. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Natalie and Ivan to keep us going. Next, on the next slide, let's see. Next slide, there we go. <laughs> well, thank you guys for that wonderful um, telling of what happened down at the border was an excellent story and I thought everyone really benefited from your guys' uh, experiences. Next up, we have CPCS Fall River and we have Jeffrey Oates. Are you ready to take it away? Um, I think I think Orrin oh, Orn is going, Ivan. <laughs> but thank you, Jeff. I know you could anyway. Um, thanks, Ivan. Uh, yes, our team spent the week at the Committee for Public Counseling Services in Fall River we focused on criminal defense all week. When someone's arrested, especially over the weekend, when their uh, hearing comes up on Monday or whichever day, they're presented with the option of hiring a, an attorney or representing themselves per se. But if they can't or won't, then they have a court appointed attorney, which is where CPCS comes in. Most of the attorneys have a case out of 45 to 65. And once the attorney has enough experience, then they can represent on rape or murder cases. It's a very specialized class. Uh, a unique component of what CPCS does is longitudinal um, with the client. When they receive a client, they stay with the client for the entirety of all of their proceedings, as opposed to letting it go to another attorney in the office. Our week, which was very eventful and enlightening, had three different components, the first of which was live courtroom observations, where we watched criminal proceedings as well as the attorney's conduct. Um, and the second part was interviews. Um, the first people we met were the two justices, Justice Finnerty and Justice Brackett, both of whom emphasized the importance of civility despite the adversarial process. 
Justice Bracket, uh, Justice Finnerty quipped that judges can hurt you, but clerks can kill you. And when we met the clerks, they very much emphasized that they're people like anyone else and deserve respect. We met with uh, a district attorney who presented his side of things as well as defense attorneys who weren't with CPCS and presented a different side of things. We also met with probations who emphasized the importance of statistical as well as empirical analysis in order to determine at risk clients and keep them on probation or out of jail at least. We met with the social services advocate for CPCS who, who applies the axiom of hurt people hurt people and they approach things in terms of client-centered representation as a holistic approach as opposed to just focusing on legal. We also met with their youth specialist who has a very unique position in that some children may have parents that are disinterested or adversarial or no parents and it's a very unique realm of litigation for them. The third component of our week was the exercises, the first of which was the mock bail hearing which is one of their favorites, and they recreated a jail setting and then a courtroom setting. So we needed to interview our clients and then represent them in the mock bail hearing. It revolved around Section 58 dangerousness in order to demonstrate that they were justified for bail. And we had to get up and present our arguments in full. The other exercise was the opening statements exercise where one of us would tell a story and the other would hear it and then reverse roles and tell a story and hear it. And then we needed to conceptualize that case and present it in an opening statement, as well as having someone else tell our story while we listen. And it's very weird being in that attorney client dynamic where normally you would tell your own story, but someone else is doing it for you or having to tell someone else's story. Um, the takeaways, and they were very prolific with their feedback, were more than anything to take your time to say what you mean, as well as making sure that you have eye contact when you speak with the people. Um, more than anything, what I put in my reflection statement what, uh, after the opening state, after the court uh, hearing was that I can't believe I wasn't better at that thing I'd never done before. And it emphasized that while our professors are fantastic and teach us procedure and substantive law, it's a progression from being a student to a lawyer and that takes time and effort. Um, I would love to thank my team. They showed up dressed, ready to bring their A-game, as well as the Feinstein Center for making it happen. Thank you so much, Oren. So great to hear about your experience. And now we're gonna hear from Prism and we're gonna have Patrick talk to us a little bit about his experience there. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Patrick Wiley. I'm a 1L. Uh, I was matched up with a fellow 1L, Lindsay Coso, and we were at a community defense project, which is part of Prism. Uh, PRISM is a nonprofit in uh, Providence focused on uh, uh, combating police discrimination, um, uh, focused with on mostly on the southeastern uh, southeastern Asian community. And uh, in addition to uh, you know, the community defense project, they also provide uh, you know a platform for community building and. Uh, different support services. Uh, we had a jam-packed week. Uh, the first day was kind of to get a sense of what the scope of work that they do. Um, what was cool about going through kind of the, the cases at hand for the attorney um, were we were able to kind of pick and choose our uh, topics of uh, research for the week. Um, our attorney, the attorney we worked with, the principal at the at the organization, Shauna Kurland, shout out uh, uh, Roger Williams alum, she's fantastic. We uh, Lindsay chose to work on a quorum novus, which is kind of like a hail mary uh, post conviction uh, relief strategy, uh, and did a lot of research on that. I worked on uh, malicious prosecution, um, so I actually drafted some arguments. Uh, to respond to the motion to dismiss for a case that Shauna was working on. Um, what was awesome about, uh, I think this is true for a lot of my uh, fellow ASB participants, is the access we had to the attorneys um, while we were at our locations. Um, while we were going through the cases, we were able to ask questions uh, in real time uh, and, you know, kind of get a sense of what the, you know, 
the things that we're learning at school and actually applying them uh, and asking real time questions. Um, so it's fantastic. Uh, the, the next day we were actually in court. Um, so we sat in on a calendar day um, uh, where the judge, you know, we watched the attorneys and um, and our and our and Shauna uh, go through kind of uh, updates for their cases. At the end of the calendar day, we actually went to chambers with the judge um, and uh, Shauna and the state attorney kind of presented uh, their next steps. Uh, at the as we walked out, Shauna apologized to us for. Uh, you know, being a little boring because everything was figured out. But in all reality, Lindsay and I were super impressed with just, you know, the active knowledge, you know, and the applicability of the law that they just demonstrated just, you know, in front of in front of the judge. So uh, uh, the next day uh, I worked on, um, I applied my Excel skills and uh, organized kind of uh, the cases uh, that Shauna had been working on into a searchable, sortable thing that um, she could use going forward, especially because the next couple of days, uh, Lindsay and I were actually, uh, we went to judicial records um, to pull uh, case documents. Uh, you know, we had to have an idea of what we we're looking for and why in order to kind of make sure we were missing anything. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, uh, if it wasn't for our uh, uh, hours doing case review, we definitely wouldn't have been able to, uh, um, you know, sift through stacks and upon stacks of uh, documents to, um, you know, make sure we were missing uh, uh, key facts. Uh, overall, it was, it was a fantastic week. I, I think for Lindsay and I, we both had um, point, you know, experiences at um, nonprofits, not necessarily legal related, but to see uh, a, you know a smaller nonprofits just um, you know huge impact on a community um, with even with limited resources, it was uh, it was it was touching and it was uh, it was um, you know it. it it definitely informed me, and I think Lindsay would agree that it informed kind of uh, the importance of the work and the skill sets that we're learning at school. So, um, you know, moving forward, I, I think that ASB is uh, quintessential for um, you know for students to be able to apply what they're learning and realize that it's, it has a real effect. Anyway, thanks for listening to me, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Next up, we have one of our new placements that we added this just this past year, uh, the Sugar Law Center for Economic Justice, and we're going to have Kaylee tell you all about it. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylee Lytle. I'm a 1L. I went to the Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice in Detroit, Michigan with my other 1L, Alyssa Nappins. We were the first RWU students at Sugar Law. Um, Sugar Law actually has a program with Georgetown. So we got to work with Georgetown law students, which was really fun during the pandemic week. We kind of got to share our stories. Um, Alyssa and I chose the Sugar Law Center because we both grew up near Detroit. We thought it was really important to give back to a community that we had explored but never dive into. Um, the Sugar Law Center works mostly with employment and labor law with uh, low income communities. And they also act as a voice for the citizens. Uh, oftentimes when developers come into the city, they want to utilize land or resources and Sugar Law acts as kind of a barrier to make sure that the city of Detroit has their citizens in mind. Um, one of the cases that we worked on during the week was a class action. It involved robo fraud in unemployment insurance. Civil procedure came in really handy while we were reading some of the complaints because we got to learn a little bit about how to apply Rule 23. We went to a uh, deposition, which was tedious and chock full of information that went right over my head. Alyssa and I specifically worked on a uh, memo for a wrongful termination and employment discrimination case. One of the coolest parts of the week was that we were able to actually meet with that client. We walked him through what we thought 
some possible, possible defenses might be from the company. Uh, we read a 1,000 page document, which was a lot of work. Um, legal practice was super helpful for that, both with the memo writing and also the research component. We were able to use the library as a resource when we got stuck on a research question that was very helpful. I think the biggest highlight for me was one of our supervising attorneys gave us a history of Detroit and why employment law and labor law are so important to the city with the assembly lines that kind of popped up. Um, workers wanted to make sure they're being taken care of. And so pro bono work specifically in employment and labor law is still really beneficial out there. It was really helpful to be able to interact directly with our clients and the community. Um, the city of Detroit needs a lot of help in a lot of different ways. And this was one of a, a new way that I had never thought about before. I really loved being back in Detroit. It was great to explore some of the areas that I hung out in and um, being able to really apply some of the legal skills that I've learned was pretty impactful. I loved the placement. I highly recommend it for anybody who's thinking about ASB and I really enjoyed my week. Thank you so much, Kaylee. It's so great to hear that um, that placement ended up being really beneficial. Um, I was really excited when I found that placement uh, last year. So cool to see that actually go all the way through full picture. So next we're gonna hear about Center for Disability and Elder Law uh, with Mark McDaniel. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules during this um, interesting uh, semester that we've had so far. So for those who do not know, my name is Mark McDaniel. I am a third year here at Roger Williams. Um, and this past spring, I had the pleasure and the honor to return back to my home region of the Midwest um, to work in downtown Chicago for the Center for Disability and Elder Law. Um, that's a mouthful, so we're just gonna call it SEAL. Um, CEDL was founded back in the 70s by the Chicago Bar Association to help serve some of the more vulnerable communities in Chicago and greater Cook County uh, where the city is located. Uh, and one of the projects that we got to do was to help out seniors in the south suburbs um, with their estate planning issues. So powers of attorney, living will documents, last wills and testaments. Um, this was a partnership that was done with state representatives also in the south suburbs. Um, Originally, this was to be a project in which six law student um, interns were to go down and help so we can get the last wills completely executed for all of the clients all in one week. Uh, but as the theme with this week in ASB, things changed on the fly. I was the only student um, that was able to go there. Um, and we really got to see the flexibility of the office as they completely changed the entire schedule and made sure that I was able to get as much experience as possible and that the clients would not have to adjust and alter their schedules all too much. Because for the office, it can be easy for us to adjust our schedules, but for real clients with real lives, especially with income levels that they have, um, being low enough to which they would even qualify for these services, uh, such flexibility may not happen. So it was very encouraging to see the flexibility of the office. Uh, on Monday, we started off by doing powers of attorney and living will documents which for me, outside of my work experience in banking, I had never really had any real experience for. Um, just a general theme, I was never able to take courses such as wills and trusts due to my work schedule. Uh, so this entire experience was almost a crash course into the practicality of such an area of law. So I had to really learn and teach myself on some of the concepts in order to discuss those with the clients. Um, and I had such a really great staff from the administrator, the um, legal director of the office, um, that really helped me get, um, get caught up to speed. Um, we worked on that on Monday, Tuesday, we started drafting last will documents. Wednesday, we got to sit in for an adverse possession case uh, for one of our clients who was dealing with a nearly 20 year long um, land dispute um, that was going on but, you know, in the state of Illinois, which is very interesting. It was great to see the cordiality between um, representatives at CEDO and opposing counsel. And it really got to show that there is a good reputation that the office has, um, as I said, since it was founded by the Chicago Bar Association. And most lawyers in the city know about CEDO and the work that they do. Um, there was a lot of cordiality between them and that was really fun to see. On Thursday, we went back to the South Suburbs and we were able to present the last wills and testaments to some of our clients, um, which was great. We got to walk them through everything and show them the assets they wanted um, to be dispersed to certain parties, those that they wanted to go to other parties, 
and really show them how the documents really cater to their needs, um, which took me back to some of my experience as a banker because that's some of the stuff we were doing um, with the financial services um, and solutions that we provided. And this overall experience showed me that working with estate planning and working with senior citizens in urban areas, similar like the city I grew up in, St. Louis, is something that I could really do very well. And I never thought about what specifically I wanted to do in pro bono work, um, but my experience here at CEDO really showed that it's something that I could excel at and really become good at um, and really provide a crucial service to people that, well, for lack of a better term, look like me and come from, you know, similar cities um, where I come from. I like to go ahead and thank the Feinstein Center, the pro bono office, and all the staff who made this opportunity possible, um, especially considering that this isn't a placement in Rhode Island. It's not a placement in southeastern Massachusetts. It truly shows the dedication that ASB has to serving communities all across the country. Um, it's a unique experience for students, especially if the student is from out of state. And I look to see it continue both at this placement and continued expansion into the Midwest and other parts of the country. So I think I get to back, back over. We are um, just, uh, we're in our final six minutes. And um, I just wanna say how fabulous our students did today. Thank you, you were tremendous. Um, this uh, is a, it takes a huge village to make this work. Natalie and Ivan have been just so wonderful with. We've had a great time. I wanna thank faculty and staff on this call for preparing our students to do these. Uh, to do these experiences. I want to thank Career Development who reviewed 52 resumes before we sent them out. Um, I want to thank especially Lisa Quinn and uh, for, for incredible logistical work to make this happen. Um, there's a huge application process. Then Lisa prepares a logistics sheet for every single placement telling them where to go and who to call with emergency numbers. She gets resumes ready to send to each placement. It's just a phenomenal amount of work. Kathy Massa, Joanne and Emma in the business office, thank you for giving us the money to do this and making it work. There's a lot of moving parts, putting money in students' accounts and trying to reimburse them. Um, it's really incredible. So um, I think that we really, there's five minutes. If anyone has a question, wants to say anything, feel free, but mostly I just wanna thank everybody for being on this call and listening and especially to our fabulous students. If we Maybe could all unmute and like go like this. That could be kind of cool, or like this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to our students. They were even better than they were in our moot uh, practice session yesterday. So I think with that, um, I'm assuming no questions. We're going to end this session. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Really, oh. really, really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Don't go. <laughs> it's <laughs> not to see everyone go. Presenting students, stay on if you if you can.